wild scene in Tucson, Arizona this morning. A shooter opening fire on an Amtrak train. One officer is dead, three others injured as we continue our Policing in America series. Facebook has demonstrated they cannot act independently. Facebook over and over again has shown it chooses profit over safety. Facebook under fire. Whistleblower Francis Haugen telling 60 Minutes last night the social media giant can't be trusted to put safety ahead of profits. Now lawmakers want answers. Also, burning their scrubs. That's what healthcare workers in Staten Island were doing over the weekend, sending a message in response to the state's vaccine mandate. And Dog the Bounty Hunter remains hot on the trail of Brian Laundrie. Was Laundrie spotted on the Appalachian Trail over the weekend? One hiker thinks so. Great to have you with us as we start another week. The Donlin Report starts right now. Good evening. The Pulse of America tonight. Facebook knows it makes you mad and does it anyway because it's good for business. That bombshell from the whistleblower who shared documents with the Wall Street Journal. Her name, Frances Haugen, a former content manager who also worked at Google and Yelp. She spoke last night to 60 Minutes. Its own research is showing that content that is hateful, that is divisive, that is polarizing, it's easier to inspire people to anger than it is to other emotions. Now, according to research we found, the average adult spends about 33 minutes on Facebook every day, but that doesn't seem like much. However, consider those who spend potentially hours on the platform. Now, we've been on this story from day one, and last week I asked one of our tech experts why Facebook doesn't use its algorithms for something more positive. The thing, I, and maybe I'm being utopian here, Shabani, but it, we know they can control the algorithms. We know that what's happening ultimately in the end is it's making us angrier and more divided. Can't they make the algorithms? Is that the only way to profit? Is that their best way to profit? So now, to credit, Shabani said, yes, they do, but it's not good for the bottom line, which Haugen confirmed last night on 60 Minutes. Facebook has realized that if they change the algorithm to be safer, people will spend less time on the site, they'll click on less ads, they'll make less money. So Facebook has two problems here. First, they have investors to answer to, investors who benefited from those algorithms and the money they generate on ads. But today, the stock closed down 5% on the whistleblower's news. A company's job, of course, is to make money. That's the bottom line, so to speak. Today's massive outage also contributed to the stock selling off. And they also have a PR problem. Last week, the company's global head of safety gave testimony on Instagram's effect on teenage girls. And it was in direct contradiction to what the whistleblower said last night. Here's part of it. The research showed that many teens say that Instagram is helping them with heart issues that are so common to being a teen. Facebook's own research says it is not just that Instagram is dangerous for teenagers, that it harms teenagers, it's that it is distinctly worse than other forms of social media. So two sides of the same issue, and regardless of where you come down on this, can and should anything be done about Facebook? That is the question. And that's where we begin tonight. Joining me now, Dr. Jeff Myers. He's the president of Summit Ministries and host of the Dr. Jeff Show. And Seth Shackner, managing director of Strat Americas. Gentlemen, thank you both for your time. Seth, I want to start with you because we talked about it in our meeting this afternoon. And it seems to me, if this were a car company knowingly picking profits over safety, there would be outrage, there would be congressional hearings, there would be fines, and there would definitely be changes. What's different with this? Well, great to be here, Joe. It's it's a different beast entirely. It, it isn't even a media company. You know, you're you're looking at something that is an advertising machine. It's a platform that uh, has almost never been seen before, and there's just a tremendous amount of user-generated content that's coming onto this thing. So the other problem I'd add on top of this is just moderation. They've got thousands of people working for them, but they need to figure out a way not only to manage that algorithm, perhaps change it, but also to moderate the content that um, that's on that network. And I, I think to date, honestly, it, it's not clear to me that they're really doing a great job of it. So it's it's a different beast to me than, than the average media company. Okay, but, but to the car wreck analogy, should Congress be doing more about this? 
I certainly think it's it's helpful to have some scrutiny on it, but I don't, you know, when I really look at the situation, I don't know if regulation is actually the actual answer to it. I think it is ultimately about more moderation, creating an environment that's actively managed. And this is this is Facebook doing it and, and probably opening up, you know, that algorithm to as, as much scrutiny and open air as possible would be my, my view on it. All right, doctor, uh, let me ask you, I guess, in, in, in addition, we probably, no matter what the safety issues were, we're not going to start stop driving and we're probably not going to stop using Facebook, or at least most of us. Uh, this, though, deals with a mental safety issue, not a physical safety question. There's no question. We are dealing through COVID with one of the worst mental health crises that our young adults in this country have ever faced. The Mental Health Association says that 90% of young people who have been screened for mental health issues have screened moderately to severely positive for depression. So we already have this tinderbox of a situation with young adults. And Facebook's own research is now showing that they know the effect that they're having on people. They know that their platforms create anger. They know that their platforms for young women especially create body image problems. Uh, you know, my concern at Summit Ministries is for young adults. They are the ones I am advocating for and they are the ones that are being victimized uh, for profits for these social media companies. Seth, Seth, let's bring you back in and talk about one of the other revelations coming from this whistleblower that, that Facebook turned off its security safeguards after the elections, but before the riots on January 6th. Let's listen to this clip and we'll ask you about it after. And the first thing I do was look at Facebook makes more money when you consume more content. People enjoy engaging with things that elicit an emotional reaction. And the more anger that they get exposed to, the more they interact and more they consume. So Seth, you've worked with a lot of social media companies. How do you explain what Facebook did in this particular situation? Well, look, they're trying to drive engagement. I'm not saying it's right, certainly isn't, if they're contributing to some seriously negative developments like we're describing here. But, um, you know, to the extent that they, you know, they can drive user engagement, whether it's good or bad, that's, that's what they're, they're ultimately trying to do here. And, and I think it's, it is a pretty sad, you know, case that, that we're seeing here. And I think they've, they've probably gone out of their way to avoid the PR pieces of this that you're describing as well. Yeah, they're doing their best to defend themselves. And, and we'll talk in just a minute about a little bit more about that. Doctor, I want to re revisit some of what you said. The numbers we found, 13.5% of teenage girls say Instagram makes the thoughts of suicide worse. And 17% of teenage girls say Instagram makes eating disorders worse. And again, this goes back to the algorithms. And I know in Congress last week, at least one of the senators was suggesting that they had set up an account knowing it was not a 13-year-old. They pretended it was, and they were fed content about eating disorders and other things. Uh, I think it's not just eating disorders. I think young people are specifically being targeted. Uh, um, my friend and one of the graduates of our program, Haley McNamara from the National Center on Sexual Exploitation, says that it only takes a predator 20 minutes to cultivate and to be a predator for a young person on Instagram. And she specifically went to Instagram with young women who had been targeted and who had been trafficked. And it took a lot of effort. I, I mean, this company should have made these changes immediately, but they simply didn't want to do it. They are almost literally putting profits ahead of the lives of their, their young customers. And the same thing is happening with political engagement. Joe, I hope we get a chance to talk about this too, because banning Trump was the most profitable thing that Facebook ever did. And I can explain how that worked. Hmm. All right. Well, we may or may not. But uh, Seth, I want to get you on one more thing. And that is essentially sure. what we're seeing here now. The takeaway seems to be, for Facebook anyway, that this is all about self-preservation. Yeah, look, they're in a tremendously competitive environment. I mean, there are other communities out there. I'll mention TikTok, which is over a billion users now, Snap, and plenty of others that want to, you know, take the younger audiences. So, you know, um, certainly they're trying to preserve that and stay competitive in this market. And I, I do think that, unfortunately, is, is part of what the strategy is all about, not, not losing those younger audiences. And, you know, all the, all the research that's come out internally, whether from the whistleblower or what's been in the Wall Street Journal, has also 
spoken to that quite clearly. So it's, it's unquestionably an uncomfortable situation for them. I would just mention that, you know, I've worked in digital business for a long time and things come up and go away. AOL, Yahoo, you know, Vine, MySpace. So, you know, at some point, maybe right. it's TikTok, there might be something else that comes along and takes those, those kids' tension away. All right, Dr. Jeff, we'll have to get you the next time on it, but we appreciate both of you joining us tonight. It's great to have your insight and your voices with us. Appreciate the time, gentlemen. Thanks, Joe. I want to turn now to a story that we brought you on Friday, but it has dropped from the headlines, especially over the weekend and today. The U.S. Women's Soccer League and the allegations against one of its top coaches. Two players came forward, Mana Shim and Sinead Farley, accusing Paul Riley of sexual coercion and more. Riley has since been fired, and the National Women's Soccer League commissioner has also resigned as a result. U.S. Soccer has now hired former acting attorney general Sally Yates to lead an investigation into the allegations of sexual misconduct. But despite the ongoing investigation and trauma these players are likely still facing, the media has pretty much moved on. Joining me now, attorney and advocate for victims of sexual abuse, Sarah Klein. She was also one of the first known victims of USA Gymnastics doctor, Larry Nasser. Sarah, the last time you and I talked was just a couple of weeks ago. I can't believe we're back and talking about something different like it again. You know what, I wish I could say I was surprised. I'm really not. It's all over the place and we've seen it in almost every sport at this point. So as heartbreaking as this is, I'm not surprised. So what do you make of the fact, as we did today, that, that a lot of the sports headlines have moved on, even on the sports websites? Uh, you know, the talk is Brady and Belichick and other things. This, this story has faded quickly. It's devastating, but I will say it's not over yet. And if I have anything to do with it, I will be sure of that. Something striking about this story is the National Women's Soccer League Commissioner, Lisa Baird, stepped down today. She is also someone who served as the Chief Marketing Officer at the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee for nine years, putting out the flowery PR statements around Nasser, taking no responsibility. So the fact that something like this could happen, um, it was reported initially in 2015, here we are in 2021, and it's finally bubbling up again. That's what I was going to ask you about, because you and I talked about the Nasser case when the gymnasts were on Capitol Hill, and I asked you the same thing at that point. How does this happen, and why did it take so long for this to come out? In the soccer situation, it wasn't as long ago, or as, I guess, long-lasting as it was with the gymnastics, but the players reported it years ago. Yeah, six years. And finally, somebody is listening. I think there's a real reckoning happening in women's sports right now. Female athletes have gone through so much and have attempted so often to speak up. And unfortunately, we saw this coach fired and rehired by another right. team after those allegations were made. It's sort of the same thing, different sport. And, and again, it plays into the fact that a real reckoning is necessary and we need to reconstruct sports as we know them with the help of Congress. Right. You know, after, after the congressional hearings, I guess we talked about this and said, what's the takeaway for young girls playing sports, Sarah? And I know this happened to you with Nasser at a very young age. I believe you were eight when it started, but um, I've had daughters who played um, sports and I, I never had the conversation with them about what was appropriate for a coach and what was inappropriate. What, what do you tell parents? Because it just wasn't a topic that I ever thought about or brought up and now think maybe I should have. Unfortunately, I say to parents, whoever the most popular coach is, whoever the most popular teacher in your child's school, that is the one, unfortunately, you need to keep the closest eye on. Wherever a coach wants to separate a parent from a child, and we're talking about child sex abuse in sport now, that's a big red flag. Parents should have a say every step of the way, and no one person should determine the destiny of an athlete. So in this case, these soccer players said, I felt like if I didn't do what he wanted, my soccer career would be harmed. And in fact, I think their careers were harmed. Um, and so those are all big red flags. No one coach should be in charge of any player's destiny ever. And if that is the paradigm, you need to speak up and speak up and speak up. And if people like the former chief marketing officer of the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee don't listen and sweep it under the rug, you speak up to someone else.
Sarah Klein, attorney and advocate for victims of sexual abuse. It's great to see you again and great to have you with us. Appreciate the time. Thank you so much. Well, when I saw this this morning, I counted 16 rounds. We'll get more on this ahead. The wild scene from Tucson, Arizona. A man on a train opening fire leaves one officer dead, three others injured as we continue our Policing in America conversation. And Dog the Bounty Hunter continues his search for Brian Laundrie. Did a hiker spot him on the Appalachian Trail over the weekend? News Nation's Brian Enton has the latest on that. He'll join us live next. And don't forget, you can follow us on social media at The Donlin Report on Twitter. A new development in the search for Brian Laundrie, whose fiance Gabby Petito was found dead last month. A hiker claims he saw the wanted man along the Appalachian Trail on the border of the Tennessee and North Carolina. Here is the 911 call where he first reported this run in. He was talking wild. He, took, he said that his girlfriend loved him and he had to go out to California to see her. And he was asking me how to get to California. And I said, well, you can get on I-40 right there and drive west and you'll get there. And he said, no, I think I can go this way and kind of left, but he was acting funny. And I wasn't sure about what he looked like. And then I got, I went and parked and pull, pulled up the photographs of him. And I'm 99.99% sure that was him. Joining me now for more on this, News Nation's Brian Enton. So, Brian, uh, give me more about what you think about this 911 call and what authorities think. How legit might it be? Well, Joe, I just actually talked to that hiker. His name is Dennis. I've been trying to get him on the phone all day long, but he's still out there hiking on the trail on the side of a mountain, so he had terrible cell service. We were able to text. Finally, he called me back a little while ago, and we, and we chatted. And basically, he says uh, 1230 in the morning on Saturday, he was right near the Tennessee-North Carolina border on the Appalachian Trail. Uh, and he is for sure, he says, that he saw Brian Laundry. He says he's been following the story. He looked at the picture right after he saw uh, this man. He says he was in a white pickup truck. Uh, he says Dennis says he's an engineer for work. He says he has to be extremely detail oriented. And, and he sounded very convincing on the phone, Joe, uh, that he knows exactly what he saw. Well, the thing about it is, Brian, is that there was some talk or thought at least that he might be in the Appalachian Trail, right? Because he was familiar with it and had actually survived out there for weeks or months at a time, hadn't he? Yeah, absolutely. He'd been out there before. He's an outdoorsman. He knows how to survive outside. This white pickup truck element is interesting, though. Uh, how did he possibly end up in a white pickup truck and then him saying that he was going to California? The other thing, after working this story for so long and seeing so many different pictures from around the country, you have to remember, I mean, he's a tall, skinny, white, bald man, Brian Laundry. So with a hat on, I mean, it, it is hard to really figure out and nail down whether these sightings are legit or not. Have you been able to get any sort of a read from local law enforcement there? So what he told me is that they are taking it seriously. Uh, he said that he's supposed to be meeting up with the FBI tomorrow uh, to go over exactly what he saw. So, so he says that law enforcement uh, is taking it seriously and following up. Yeah, my guess is they're probably heading that way right now if they're not already there. Uh, Dog the Bounty Hunter posted video of him searching a swamp in Florida. So what does that mean as far as dog search and whether he thinks laundry is still in Florida? Well, he is still here right now. There was some debate today about whether he was going to head up north near the trail, but he opted to stay here in Florida. Uh, he was out in the water. He's still been focusing on the campground area. He's been looking around boats and the islands there. Uh, he came across a campsite. He says he turned over some of the items that he found to law enforcement for DNA testing. Uh, but again, so far, still no confirmed sightings of Brian Laundry. All right, Brian Enton, live for us again in Northport, Florida. Brian, thank you. Thanks. That video from Tucson, Arizona this morning at an Amtrak station. 
The DEA and local law enforcement conducting a routine check for weapons and anything else suspicious on board, and that's when the suspect opened fire, exchanging shots with law enforcement officers. He then barricaded himself into an area of the train and was eventually found dead inside a bathroom on that train. One DEA agent was killed, and an update on what I had said earlier, two other law enforcement officers Two, not three, were injured. Joining for more, uh, me for more on this now, Zeke Arkham, active police officer in New York and also frequent visitor and guest on our show here. Zeke, this is something we seem to talk about every week, just how dangerous this job is. And it seems like people are getting more and more brazen, even though cameras are everywhere. We hear now that homicides are up. People are blaming COVID. People are blaming a lack of mental health. What do you think is going on? I think it's a combination of a lot of things. I think it's a combination of COVID. I think it's a, lot, a, a com, uh, mental health issue. I think it's the lawlessness that's been going on and being almost encouraged by elected officials with defund the police, with the endorsement of Black Lives Matter, with almost the elevation of criminals. And all these things combined are going to have an effect on not just law enforcement, but everyone. You know, they're not going to start talking. They're not just going to target law enforcement. They're going to target regular civilians as well. well. So we all need to be concerned about this. Right. But they are targeting law enforcement, which is really sort of a new wrinkle in all of this. The last time I think I checked, 48 police officers in Chicago, I believe, had been shot at so far this year. And I think 12 of them hit. Yeah, there seems to be no lack of concern about collateral damage or who's in the way. Well, no. I mean, the criminal mindset is that they're not going to worry about you know, the little five-year-old kid that's staying in their way or the grandmother that's in their way. They're going to go and get their beef settled. They're going to go and do what they have to do because that's just a criminal mindset. So anybody else that's hurt within the crossfire is just, that's, they're going to get hurt. The problem with law enforcement is that our hands are so handcuffed and tied and we are so unable to do things to stop these killings and stop these crimes and stop these violent murders going on that is just going to spiral out of control. Yeah, I mean, that, that video from the train, you could see the one canine officer running. I'm not sure if he was one who was hit or not, but in this situation, three officers involved in the gunfire there. A couple of other examples, Zeke, I want to get. Uh, before you go, is these folks getting brazen. One of them was shoplifting. It was a situation in the Portland area, a little south of Portland and Woodburn, that turned into essentially an armed robbery. And then there was another situation that I'm sure you've seen and heard about because it's in your neck of the woods there about the George Floyd uh, statue being uh, vandalized there. These are all happening, a lot of these things, as we mentioned, in the middle of the daytime. Well, the robbery in Oregon really doesn't surprise me because Oregon has pretty much been the hotbed of lawlessness and anarchy. You know, when you've got elected officials like mayors or district attorneys that see themselves more as activists that think that they're doing the right thing by being soft on crime instead of doing their job protecting people and being hard on crime, being tough on crime, and that's where the problem lies. As far as the George Floyd Memorial getting vandalized, I mean, I, I'm still confused as to, you know, why George Floyd even has a memorial. I understand the whole Derek Chauvin thing was very bad and no law enforcement official supports Derek Chauvin. But I mean, just also a story came out that there were 21 kids under 18 killed since the beginning of the year. Where are their memorials? All right, Zeke, uh, thank you very much for the time. We appreciate it. Good to see you. Thank you. We have seen this video over the weekend out of Washington. Protesters following Senator Kirsten Cinema into the bathroom, all the way to the stall. Can a woman get five minutes to herself without getting harassed? And are stunts like this causing Americans to lose faith in the system, and in this case, in Democrats? Here in Chicago, the city set to face off with the football team, the Bears, over a new stadium. Do billionaire uh, stadiums? Do billion dollar stadiums rather provide any benefit to the taxpayers paying for them? We'll get into that ahead. Take a look at this. Protesters calling for the president's three and a half trillion dollar spending plan, chasing Senator Kirsten Cinema all the way to the bathroom stall. Cinema, a centrist Democrat, has said the plan is too big. Angry protesters also calling her the clown of Arizona. President Biden responding today. I don't think they're appropriate tactics, but it happens to everybody. From the, <laughs> the only people it doesn't happen to are people who have Secret Service standing around them. 
So not appropriate, but happens to everybody, according to the president. Julia Manchester, our friend, national political reporter at our partner, The Hill, joins us now. So, uh, Julia, let's start with this. And the president siding with progressives for the most part, given all of this, is the left starting to feel a little emboldened here, chasing people into bathroom stalls? Absolutely, Joe. In fact, I talked to some progressive organizations today who said, look, these tactics are just a result of the situation they find themselves in with Senator Cinema. They say that Senator Cinema has not responded to their request to meet and discuss a lot of these issues. And they point to the fact that Senator Joe Manchin, the other moderate uh, Democratic senator that is opposing this $3.5 trillion reconciliation bill, they say that he's met with some progressive activists today. So definitely a push and pull between both sides on this issue, but progressives saying they are not letting up on Kirsten Cinema. Yeah, you probably saw this as well over the weekend, Saturday Night Live, having a little fun and highlighting this as well. Let's watch. Yeah. What do I want from this bill? I'll never tell, because I didn't come to Congress to make friends. And so far, mission accomplished. All right, so, I mean, we laughed, Julia, but I guess, you know, when you look back, I was talking about it today in the meeting that you've seen this now in, in elevators, at restaurants, at airports. I think the thing that makes this a little different, though, is it's sort of Democrats going after a Democrat. Absolutely. I think this really highlights the divide that's within the party right now. And I think, like you said before, Joe, how emboldened progressives are becoming in targeting a particular moderate senator. Look, this is going to be difficult for President Biden to try to um, bridge the gap between these two sides of his party because, look, he comes from the moderate wing. That's his bread and butter. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you are seeing progressives really starting to grow in power in the House and really in the campaign world. In, uh, essentially targeting cinema and mansion and essentially threatening to potentially primary her. We're seeing that there are a number right. of uh, PACs that have been uh, launched uh, that threatened a primary cinema. So that's an issue here. All right, Julia Manchester, national political reporter at The Hill, our partners. Good to see you again, Julia. Thank you. So Senator Cinema and Manchin both holding out support due to the bill's cost. The White House, though, still insisting it doesn't cost anything at all. This is not going to cost the American public a dollar. This is going to, we're going to pay for this by asking corporations the highest income, so people under $400,000, I should say, corporations' highest income to cover the cost of these necessary investments. All right, Grover Norquist uh, joins us now, our friend and uh, tax hawk, I guess, if you will. It's good to see you again, Grover. So the Washington Post gives this to Pinocchios. I, I want to start there with you because we always hear this. If this... And if that, then maybe it won't cost anything. Well, it's nonsense. It's going to cost three and a half trillion dollars. If you take three and a half trillion dollars from some people and give it to somebody else, there's a cost involved. Uh, so, and, and worse than that, the corporate income tax, the politicians know, uh, the corporate income tax is paid by workers. Uh, you know, even the, the government calculations know that about seven, well, tax foundation, 70% of the cost of uh, corporate income tax is paid by workers directly in lower wages. There's a British university study that says it's 98% over time. Because where do they think people get this money from? If a corporation has money taken out of it and it needs to compete in the world, they can raise prices a little bit, but they do have competitors from other countries who don't aren't hitting Biden's tax increases. Uh, and so you can only raise tax, uh, uh, raise the uh, cost so much. A lot mm -hmm. of it comes directly out of workers. When they do raise costs, it hits all consumers, not just the rich. And when they go after workers, it hits all Americans. This is being paid for by everyone. Biden seems to be the only one who doesn't know that. We seem to hear this all the time, though, Grover, and that's what surprises yeah. me. I mean, President Trump's tax cut was supposed to pay for itself. There, every time we hear about these, give me an example of something like this that paid for itself. Well, there have been some tax cuts where growth is such that it didn't cost, it didn't lose the government as much money as the government thought it would over time. At the end of Reagan's term, the government was making a lot more money than at the beginning of the Reagan's term uh, as a result of tax cuts and growth. Growth is the way you get more resources 
into the government without raising taxes. So you really want to have a pro-growth policy. The problem with what Biden and the left wing of the Democratic Party are doing is everything they're doing will slow economic growth. The regulations will slow down growth. The higher energy costs slow down growth. The raising the costs on, for businesses slows growth. Uh, each of these things slows growth, reduces the number of people who are employed, and then the rest of us have to pay more to make up for that less revenue. We will continue to follow the Grover Norquist, Americans for Tax Reform President. Good to see you, Grover. Thanks for the time. Good to be with you. After years of talks and negotiations with Chicago officials, it seems very likely the Chicago Bears will be moving to Arlington Heights, a suburb of Chicago, possibly in 2026. That's when the team can buy its way out of its lease at Soldier Field, which was built 97 years ago. Last renovation, 2003. But who will foot the bill? Over the past 20 years, more than $7 billion in public money has gone toward financing the construction and renovation of NFL football stadiums, the three newest stadiums, costing billions of dollars each to build. Here to talk about this, investigative reporter for WGN in Chicago and my old friend, Ben Bradley. Ben, it's good to have you. Nice to be with you, Joe. So this thing is interesting because it kind of went south right out of the gate as soon as the Bears mentioned that they might be moving to the suburbs. The, Mayor Lightfoot has not had a great start uh, to her <laughs> term, her first two years between COVID, crime, and now the Bears. Mm -hmm. uh, over the summer, Mayor Lightfoot essentially said, Mayor, the Bears are talking about putting in a bid for some land northwest of Chicago. What do you think? She said, well, I, I don't know anything about it. I think they should probably focus on beating the Packers. That didn't go over well. That didn't go over <laughs> well. And we've since learned that between then and when the Bears announced that they had signed a deal to buy this land northwest of Chicago, the mayor and the Bears, the McCaskey family, which owns the team, didn't have a single conversation. Wow, how about that? So what's a city to do, Ben? I mean, mm. at this point, we've seen a number of cities held hostage essentially for billions. Teams are saying, build us a new stadium mm -hmm. or, or we're going to walk. And a lot of the cities have said, good luck. So it depends on what type of city you are and how dependent you are on that team. So for example, in Southern California, SoFi Stadium, home of the Rams right. and the Chargers, that was built $5 billion uh, and that was built entirely uh, out of Stan Kroenke's wallet. He's a billionaire, so he can do it. Uh, the original cost, by the way, was supposed to be about $2 billion. It went up to $5 billion. Right. Uh, But even in these deals where the owners pay, there's still taxpayer kick-in. In Southern California, it's $100 million in infrastructure improvements, ramps and train stations and things like that. On the flip side, if you're a city like Indianapolis or your hometown of St. Louis, mm -hmm. and you risk losing what is arguably the most identifiable thing about your city, and that is your sports team, those are the scenarios where taxpayers end up putting in a huge portion of the deal. In Indianapolis for Lucas Oil Stadium, 86% of the cost picked up by the taxpayers. Right. What, and what do they get out of it? I said, this is the question, because when the Chargers left San Diego, I felt mm. awful because they have a great history yeah. there. But you can understand where a city like San Diego would say, listen, is it worth all of this money for essentially eight Sundays a year mm -hmm. and a couple of preseason games? So it means a lot for a city's identity. It means a lot for a city's culture. But in terms of dollars and cents, uh, yeah, you're getting a lot of economic activity around the stadium on Sundays. Uh, but economists have debated this for years because every city and every team will come up with an economic impact study that says, right. hey, we're going to bring billions to town. Uh, much like with the Olympics, it's oftentimes hard to after the actual cost to taxpayers to quantify whether or not this was a good deal. And a lot of teams play outside the cities they claim as, mm. as their you know, name, right? They do, and you better believe when the blimp is flying over a Chicago Bears game in Arlington Heights, you're not going to see the northwest suburbs of Chicago. They'll be showing our skyline. <laughs> All right, Ben Bradley, good to have you. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. Burning their scrubs. That's what healthcare workers in Staten Island were doing this weekend, sending a message in response to the state's vaccine mandate. And which is it, Dr. Fauci? One day, he says holiday gatherings are in question for the unvaccinated. Now he says his comments were taken out of context. We'll discuss the ever-changing COVID guidelines coming up. Massive protest in New York City today over vaccinations for teachers in the nation's largest district. A COVID vaccine mandate took effect today 
after a back and forth battle in the courts. News Nation's Tom Negevin has been following this protest. He's live for us at New York City Hall tonight. And Tom, this protest actually tied up traffic into Manhattan earlier today. It sure did. Yeah, it sure did, Joe. Along the Brooklyn Bridge, actually. This started in Brooklyn, and the video we want to show you from uh, our camera crews, our local affiliate, WPIX, here in New York, and uh, ourselves. Pretty dramatic, actually. It actually built as it got closer to where we are to New York City Hall, then sort of poof, dispersed. But it started at the Board of Education headquarters in Brooklyn, and it was about 250 people at that point, so a pretty small group, and hundreds more joining on as they crossed the Brooklyn Bridge, actually stopping for a brief time inbound traffic into Manhattan, into New York City for a while. Folks are very, very upset about the New York City Board of Education vaccine mandate for school district employees, teachers in particular, that took effect today. Uh, Mayor de Blasio uh, announcing that 96% of teachers are now fully vaccinated. 99% of principals in New York public schools, about 3,700 teachers, a very small minority, still uh, unvaccinated. They say they have vaccinated subs to make up for those, but the people you're seeing in the crowd of protesters here, very, very upset and um, not uh, entirely teachers. In fact, the majority may not be teachers. A lot of folks joining on here to make a political statement against the Biden administration, against Anthony Fauci, against New York's uh, mayor and the Democratic establishment here, calling this, Joe, medical tyranny. As you know, the first really big test of a vaccine mandate here in New York City, one that's been through the courts already now a couple of times. Tom Negevin, Live Force in New York, Greg coverage on a, uh, on a big protest today. Tom, thanks again. Sure. So, is Anthony Fauci the doctor who stole Christmas? Here are his comments from the weekend. But we can gather for Christmas or it's just too soon to tell? You know, Margaret, we, it's just too soon to tell. We've just okay. got to concentrate on continuing to get those numbers down and not try yeah. to jump ahead by weeks or months and say what we're going to do at a particular time. Many of us are back to work. Kids are in school. Two million people a day are flying. But a holiday gathering uncertain? Well, then he said this today. That was misinterpreted as my saying we can't spend Christmas with our families, which was absolutely not the case. I will because be spending Christmas with my family. I encourage people, particularly the vaccinated people who are protected, to have a good, normal Christmas. Dr. Yvonne Maldonado is an infectious diseases expert at Stanford University. Doctor, it's great to have you. I guess the first question out of that is, why didn't he say that the first time? <laughs> You know, he's been on television just about every day for 18 months. I think, you know, sometimes he just gets things wrong. Yeah. Is it a problem, though, a bigger problem, doctor, about the mixed messaging? I mean, I, I, I really we've covered this so much. I don't know what to think anymore. I don't know if anyone knows yeah. what to think anymore. It seems to me like over the weekend we had the football game there at Stanford, and uh, I'm sure you were happy about that. You beat my Oregon Ducks. <laughs> and after <laughs> afterwards, sorry about that. Yeah, that's all right. It's 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 the duck fans are used to that down there at the farm. But uh, after the game, you know, the students are all climbing out onto the field, and you know, we watch this and think, I, I don't know what to think anymore, Doc. Well, you know, we are, uh, you know, as you heard earlier in the pandemic, we are flying as we're building this plane. But we do know a lot more. And by the way, I was at the game myself. I was there last week too. Um, and everybody was either vaccinated or had a negative test. So I think you can be pretty comfortable that it was not a super spreader event. Right. And I think Dr. Fauci, and again, I am not defending him at all, but I think he was trying to make a, a you know, trying to be careful because we went through a horrible Christmas last year. It was really terrifying right. for those of us, all of us. And I think he's just a little nervous about making these statements, but you're right. He probably should have just said, yes, let's get together, but let's be careful and vaccinated. Right. Absolutely. That was what I was going to say, because as I walked by and saw these new guidelines, I thought that sounds an awful lot like we heard what we heard last year. I mean, are we not farther along than that? It seemed to me like the message should have been if you're vaccinated, pass the eggnog. Yeah, you know, I think people are still worried about this variant. It's a really scary variant. We are doing some work in my lab as well. It's, it's, a, it's a very uh, tricky virus. Um, it's evolved even to be even trickier. So I do think that vaccination got us a long way, but it's 
There are people who are still worried that if you're vaccinated, you can still transmit to other people. And that's the big concern. If you have somebody in your family who's immunocompromised, who uh, has multiple underlying conditions, I think I'd be a little more careful. Sure. But I do think we're in a way better place than we were last year. Absolutely. I'm sure you saw the story, if not here, then elsewhere, about the, the nurses burning their scrubs in, in New York. Um, you know, last year it, it stood out to we were banging pots and pans celebrating all of you on the front mm -hmm. lines. And now what's happened now? Well, your uh, your reporter also said a lot of those people weren't healthcare workers, and they also brought up the word politics in there. This is virus is not political, but I also know from my own experience here at our hospital that people are tired. Um, I think they're worried. Uh, they want to start getting back to normal, and I think a lot of people uh, are doing the right thing. You heard. 97% people are vaccinated, but I think there's right. a small group that's still unhappy, and I, I understand. Yeah. It's not, it doesn't feel good to be told that you need to still worry about this. Yeah, we noted last year when we pulled that uh, interview from Dr. Fauci, he was saying even back then that people were suffering from COVID fatigue. I did want to get you on another thing, doctor. Th this whole thing, I think a lot of healthcare workers, and you tell me if I'm wrong, are wary of the shot because they've had COVID and we keep hearing this argument about whether you know natural immunity is better than the vaccine. A lot of people in the healthcare industry believe that they've had the virus and they have the antibodies, they get tested, they don't need the vaccine. What would you say to that? You know, the immune system is a pretty complicated. We don't really understand exactly what the real measure of immunity is. We have to do the studies to see uh, what protects people, what doesn't, and we just haven't had that data yet. I would say overall, from what I've seen, that the vaccine produces really great immunity, and I don't know why at this point, after over a, a billion doses of vaccine being given around the world, this is the most studied vaccine we've ever had, why m most people, now I get it that some people have underlying conditions and may be concerned, but most people will be fine with this vaccine. Yeah. Um, I think there's just a lot of misinformation, uh, and again, as you said, I have never seen our workforce so burned out. It's really a tragedy. Right. It sure is. Dr. Yvonne Maldonado of Stanford University, it's great to have you. Thanks for your time. And again, congratulations to the Cardinal of that big win over the weekend. Glad you enjoyed the game.